Thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, the, the impetus for this session, this founder chat was um, a lot of us have been fielding uh, questions about what's going on with the economy, with the public markets, with the VC markets. So thought it was worthy of a discussion. Um, thanks to everyone who submitted questions in advance. We've tried to organize the session so that we cover as much of that as possible. And if you have other questions during the conversation, just throw them in the chat and there'll be time at the end that we can cover those. Um, and I just ask that everyone go on mute for the session and at the end, we'll, we'll take some people off mute if they've got questions. Uh, there's, there's, uh, we're gonna structure this in sort of three parts. So the first is a higher level view, what's happening, why it, why it might be happening, what's next and then uh, get into the meat of it, which is what should we be doing about this? And there's kind of two categories. One is operating your business and the other is thinking about financing. Um, so just to kick things off, um, we start with you, David. So there's obviously there's been a lot of conversation about um, a downturn, a potential recession. Uh, maybe you can just take a few moments and explain or share your point of view on how we got to where we are and, um, and where you think things are heading. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, so first let me just describe what's been happening in the public markets. Um, can we, um, Sarah, can we go ahead and show the, the first slide? So there's starting around the first week of November, there's been a pretty substantial correction related to uh, primarily growth stocks in the market, but really anything long dated. So crypto has seen a huge correction since the beginning of November. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the whole NASDAQ has corrected, but especially, you know, uh, growth stocks, recent IPOs, SPACs, things like that. Um, this was, well, actually go, go to the next one. I think it might be easier to, to read. Okay, so this was um, showing the change in um, some, uh, some tech stocks as of the end of December and, January was was basically that the January was almost as bad as um, the November to December period. So we saw something like a thirty to fifty percent correction between call it November eighth and December thirty first, and then in the month of January we saw like another thirty to fifty percent uh, correction, depending on what the stock what the stock is. And the thing that triggered all of this is that around the beginning of, of November, uh, the Fed started getting very hawkish um, in their talk about rates. Um, there was, uh, you know, th this was in response to a, a, an inflation print of 7%, basically CPI. If you remember back to last summer, we started seeing uh, inflation run hot. It was around five point something percent last summer, but the Fed said it was transitory. Then the next print was like six point something percent. And but still, the Fed said it was transitory, and then you know you finally got like an inflation print of about seven percent. Um, it was earlier uh, in in January, and so the Fed has gotten kind of religion since November around this, and has been making very hawkish statements. And you know, so back in November, they uh, they basically the the forecast at that point or the expectations were that they would end quantitative easing at the end of March, which basically just means their own purchase of, of government bonds, which pump, sort of pumps money into the economy. They would end that at the end of March, um, as opposed to the end of Q2, which is what they had previously said. And they telegraphed three rate increases last year. Now, I think the market is expecting five rate increases this year. So the, the Fed has been getting progressively more hawkish. And as a result of that, um, you know, there's been a, uh, again, expectation of rate increases and rate increases decrease the value of any of anything long dated, right? Because the net present value of those future cash flows is dis discounted much more heavily. So um, higher interest rates aren't good for any kind of asset, but um, they're most bad for, you know, growth, growth stocks where uh, all the earnings are in the distant future. So let's go to the next slide. So what you can see here is these are some slides put together by Altimeter um, that uh, you can kind of see that what's happened, that this, this slide uh, was just produced. So it, it does go through the end of January. Um, 
you can see that there's been like a historic reversion to the mean in the valuations of um, of internet stocks. So this is the internet index. It's that um, formula up there stands for uh, enterprise value divided by next 12 months um, long-term uh, EBITDA. So that's basically earnings, uh, earnings before interest taxes, depreciation and amortization. Um, so if you can see here that historically, the average um, was around uh, 19 times. And um, uh, well, sort of in this like 17 to 21 times, depending on which, which index you use. And you can see that as of the time this chart was made, I think a couple of days ago, we had gotten all the way down to 17 times. So maybe it was a little bit oversold relative to the historical averages. And that's maybe why over the last two days in the markets, you've seen like a 10% or so bounce back in growth stocks. But, you know, I wouldn't read too much into that. I mean, basically it means that growth stocks are down 60%, instead of 66%. Um, but the reason for this is again, because um, we had this, uh, this huge like asset bubble that happened and, and, and where you can see it is um, right, right after, if you look at like January of um, 2020, yeah, there was that dip there below 16 times. That was basically the COVID crash when the market went down like 30% on COVID fears. And that began unprecedented um, fiscal monetary stimulus coming out of Washington. They pumped something like $12 trillion into the economy over you know, a two year period. And that caused this massive asset inflation. And, um, and, and, and basically the air started coming out of the balloon in November when the Fed telegraphed tightening and, and rate hikes. And, and so that's basically what, what's been happening. Let's go to the next slide. And you can see that here, this is the SaaS index and you know, Kraft is a heavy SaaS investor and many, if not most of you, um, you know, are SaaS companies. You can see the same type of idea here. This is median enterprise value divided by next 12 months revenue for, this is for public SaaS companies. And you can see that like this um, stimulus, like all this liquidity being shoved into the markets caused, um, SaaS valuation, the median SaaS valuation to be, to reach about 16 times um, next 12 months revenue. That's sort of like ARR, not quite, but sort of like, you can think of it as roughly 16 times ARR, whereas the historical average would be more around eight times. So it's not that like these companies have done poorly. It's not like they've stopped growing or that they've seen revenue or earnings shrink. It's just that the multiples have contracted or reverted back to historical means. So, you know, the valuations we were seeing in the public markets where, you know, 16 times was the average, that was, it turns out the historical aberration and now everything's reverted back. Now, you know, that 16 times is going to mask a lot of differences with, you know, the average is going to mask a lot of differences that you have to think in terms of cohorts. It's going to be a top 25% of SaaS companies in terms of growth and uh, quality or, you know, moat, that kind of stuff. And they're going to have like a much higher multiple. And then there's going to be other companies that aren't growing that fast. They're going to have a lower multiple. So this is more of the average across all those different cohorts. You can get much more precise about, you know, which cohort you'd be in as a public company. But, um, but the bottom line is that, you know, that multiples had inflated to about 2X uh, where they historically have been. And now they've gone back to, to normal. So this is basically what's been happening over the last three months is that, you know, the, the, <clears throat> I think it's, it, the, the air has sort of come out of the, the balloon and, and that air was the liquidity pumped into the system by the fed because of, of COVID. Um, so how does this trickle down to, you know, private markets? Well, what we've seen is that the late stage investors like Tiger and Kotu, who are, you know, or D1, the so-called crossover investors, because they invest in both um, public and private companies. Well, their models for putting valuations on SaaS companies, they were based on the public comps, right? So, um, so the, you know, they were, they, they're the first ones to notice, oh, wait a second, um, the, the public markets are valuing these companies at 50% of what they were three months ago. 
Uh, you could think about their business model as, as an arbitrage between investing in, call it the, the, the last private round of a company and then, you know, IPOing a year or two later and, you know, and reaping the difference. And, um, and the, the reason why I think Tiger got so aggressive um, in, in terms of late stage investing is because, you know, he, these guys were running a gigantic hedge fund. They saw the profits that were being made by late stage investors. You know, they were making five, 10 times their money in one or two years just by investing in the last private round. So then Tiger moves upstream. They start investing in the last private round. Then they start looking at the profits being made by the second to last private investor and, you know, and so on down the line. So everybody, and so they start investing more and more at earlier and earlier stages, you know, ultimately with this like ARB in mind to the public markets. Well, so if the public markets now correct 50% in terms of valuations, that is going to trickle down. It's going to make its way through the system because the latest stage guys are not going to pay the same prices. That means the mid-stage guys, investors are, um, they're, 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 gonna, they're not going to be able to pay as much and so on down the line. So I think what you're seeing now is um, valuations are in the process of resetting. Um, we don't really know exactly where they're going to be, but I think there's, while there's still a decent amount of investing going on, a lot of the most active players from last year are sort of, I think, taking a pause while they figure out where the new valuation levels are going to land. And um, and look, we 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 don't know either. Um, you know, we're not we're we're in we're still in fundamentally a good economy. Um, you know, three and a half percent unemployment rate is a good economy. Um, uh, there's no wars going on as of yet. Um, you know, so it's not like we are in an I, I wouldn't call it like a nuclear winter. It's just that. Um, it's just that, that, you know, that the public, that, that there's a valuation reset happening and we're going to, it's probably going to take a couple of months to see exactly where those, where deals land. I think what's happening right now is that a lot of deals aren't getting done because there's a big gap in expectations between what founders want and what investors as of now are willing to pay. So I think a lot of founders aren't liking the valuations they see and they would rather wait to see if there's a bounce back or or just to deliver more ARR, right? So, you know, we saw a lot of rounds last year where founders would raise when there was still a lot of money in the bank. And um, I think you'll see less of that now because as capital becomes more dear, as valuations go down, there's no reason to take on that excess dilution until you need to. Um, so, you know, I would say like a, a period, I, I think like valuation resets kind of translate into a period of illiquidity when both sides of the marketplace are trying to figure out where things land. And I think that's what we're seeing now. Um, I guess there's three possible scenarios. There could be like a bounce back. Things could stay kind of where they are or things could get worse. Um, it's a lot easier to describe what's happened over the last three months than to predict what's going to happen over the next three months. Um, I tend to think that, um, let, let's go back to that Altimeter slide. Sarah, could you put the Altimeter slide back on? Um, Coming. Yeah, so I, I tend to think that um, the, the reason why, like, I think it's unlikely that we would just bounce back to like status quo, like mid 2001 or something like that, or late 2001 is just because like this reversion to the mean, the historical average kind of suggests that things were just like very inflated last year. And uh, so I'd be surprised if they just bounce back to that level. Um, I think also, um, you know, I don't know that things need to get a lot worse because I think even in the last couple of days in the market, there's been, there's a sense that things got oversold. So, and people have been kind of bargain hunting. So it feels like where we're at now in the public markets is sort of the, the correct level in terms of his, by historical terms, there's always the chance for news to affect things. So like, for example, if over the next six months, we get some good inflation readings it turns out that inflation 
was transitory, maybe not on like a six month basis, but on a two year basis, actually, you know, supply chain corrects. A lot of this like stimulus check money flows through the system. Inflation comes down. Now we don't need five rate hikes anymore. Maybe there's only two or three. That actually would be would lead to a bounce for stocks. I don't think it'll bounce to 16 times ARR. It might bounce from eight to 10 or 11 or 12 or something like that, but not 16 times. Um, but there's also room for downside, right? I mean, if inflation keeps running hot, if the Fed has to raise interest rates to 3%, um, if there's a war, I mean, always there's always a chance for news to affect what's happening one way or another. Um, but it feels like, you know, again, like looking at this chart that the last three months has been a correction. And now I think we're going to find a new level in venture markets that's more similar to the pre-COVID status quo than to the post-COVID status quo. And, um, you know, I remember like pre-COVID, you know, pricing SaaS deals at 20 to 30 times ARR was pretty standard. Um, you know, it was only in, let's say the second half of last year, late 2021, where like all of a sudden this magic number of hundred times ARR started being bounced around, like it was no big deal. And you'd even see outlier deals, like heavily competitive outlier deals at 200, 250 times ARR. I, you know, I feel like that pretty clearly was an artifact of, um, of this asset bubble that, that we saw. I'd be surprised if that, those kinds of numbers come back. Um, you know, anything can happen, but um, seems unlikely. Um, but look, there's a huge range between 20 times and 100 times ARR. And so we'd have no idea where valuation levels are gonna land. Um, and they may be a moving target for some period of time. Um, so in any event, I think, you know, that's kind of maybe a, a too long-winded explanation of what's been happening in the public markets and how it trickles down to private markets. Um, I think, you know, in terms of how you guys should be thinking about running your business, um, I think it's generally a good idea just to ignore completely what's happening in the public markets. Um, it doesn't affect you, uh, except unless you're in the market to raise money. That's the only time it's going to affect you is when you have fundraising to do. And, um, you know, I think, um, and I think, uh, you know, we can, we can delve more, more deeply into this, but, um, you know, I think fundraising should be seen as, um, you know, it's something you do because you need the money to grow your business, you know? And um, I think you run the best process you can when you need the money and, you um, and, and, you know, I think there's a bunch of, a bunch of suggestions that I would have in that regard, but let me put a pin in it, uh, in that for now. Maybe that's one of the topics we can delve into more. Why don't I, because I've been talking for a while, Brian, why don't I pause there and yeah. we can get into kind good. of, I think maybe this is just a couple of topics. One is like how you should be operating your business during a downturn. And then the other is just suggestions on fundraising. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Let's get into that. There were so many questions from everyone about this lag between the public market activity and, and private market, the VC market. So um, before we get into the how to operate your business, um, and it's awesome to have the two of you who ran businesses during downturns with PayPal and StubHub. But before we get into that, Jeff, any comments from you about that that delay between public market action and, and the VC markets or, or what founders, how founders should be interpreting what's happening? Yeah, absolutely. So um, first of all, great to have all of you here. Thanks for uh, thanks for taking the time. Um, I think, look, obviously you've got in, in the public stock markets, you've got stock prices that move every day, every minute, every second. So everything's stock prices are adjusting in real time all the time. And, um, you know, and the market participants are always acting on a forward looking basis. So they are they are trying to figure out what's going to happen over the next six, 12 months, even 24 months. And um, and making adjustments to stock prices today based on that kind of forward-looking set of you know opportunities and risks that are are um, inherent in the market, and so the the, the private markets just don't um, you know don't adjust that way, right? There's generally a negotiation between you know a single seller, which is the the you know founders of the company, and um, and multiple potential buyers who are the, the venture investors. Um, whereas in, you know, in the, in the public markets, you've obviously got many sellers and many buyers buying the same security, buying the same stock. So 
um, you know, things just are stickier. They, they tend to adjust more slowly. And, um, and, you know, as David alluded to earlier, I think you've got this dynamic where, you know, there's, um, you know, founders expectations, you know, don't adjust, um, you know, as quickly maybe as in, in investors expectations. So um, there tends to be these kind of also uh, sort of longer processes that maybe don't, um, don't, uh, you know, close out financings as quickly as they, as they were um, previously. So I think all of that leads to like just generally an environment where, um, where you get this lag. Having said that, I definitely think that the, the private markets are absolutely affected by the public markets, um, you know, for all the reasons David said, where you've got this kind of cascading effect of everybody looking at sort of the, you know, what, what the next round is going to, um, is kind of going to uh, culminate in from a valuation perspective. And, and, you know, when you're the latest stage investor, you're looking at the public markets um, and you need to adjust down and, um, and therefore the round before that then has to adjust down and, and so on and so on. So um, I definitely think valuations will come down, but, you know, right now, obviously corporate earnings have been really positive. You, you know, Apple and Microsoft both in the last, you know, week to 10 days have announced really strong earnings companies, you know, the, the, in the, the economic, environment is really strong. It's really just this normalization of valuation. So, um, so I, I do think there'll be a normalization in the private markets, just like there has been in the public markets. Um, and that's probably, you know, a, a you know, three month lag at most. Cool. Okay. Let's, um, let's and, and just, uh, just to add to that. Sometimes, um, you know, founders are suspicious of whenever VCs talk about valuations coming down, that somehow we're talking our book. I mean, first of all, we're not in a negotiation with all of you. We're already investors. And so we're just giving you our best advice. The other thing is that, you know, we, we've always seen our, we've always seen ourselves as price takers. Like our job is to sort of pick the companies that we want to be in business with and the founders we want to partner with. And then we just kind of pay the prevailing valuations. And there's, and I think most VCs actually see the world that way. Um, some are trying to set prices one way or another, but most just kind of see their job as picking and paying the prevailing rates. So, you know, this is not like motivated in any way by us talking our book. I think what we're just saying is that the prevailing rates are in a process of changing in light of, um, the, you know, the, the price discovery that's happened in the public markets over the last three months. Um, all right, let's move on to uh, running your business, both from operations and then uh, financing. We'll hold to that till the end. Um, Jeff, can you, we were talking about this yesterday, um, that it's not all, during a downturn, downturn, it's not all bad news. So can you share a little bit of your experience, your perspective on the pros and cons of being a founder, being a CEO um, during a downturn? Yeah, sure. So um you know, I guess I'll, I'll give this sort of summary first and then maybe talk a little bit about kind of the, the details and how I learned it. But the, the summary is that actually um, a lot of stuff actually gets easier in a downturn. So I think it's premature to say that we're in a downturn. Right now, all we're in is a, a normalization of stock prices. There's a chance that we go into a downturn because there's all these kind of like related forces happening. There's the wealth effect where if people feel a lot less wealthy, they may spend less money. If they spend less money, that means less growth in the economy. And of course, you know, recession is defined as negative growth in the economy. So that could that could cause a downturn. Higher interest rates could mean less borrowing, which means less spending by corporate America, which could also kind of instigate a downturn. So all of these things could come, um, could, could point to a recession coming. It's not, we're certainly not there yet. It's not clear we will be there. All we have right now is a resetting of prices. But if we go into a downturn, I think that, you um, I think that there's definitely some positives actually in that. And I would say the, the one thing that gets harder for entrepreneurs pretty much across the board is, is access to capital. Like raising money becomes harder, valuations come down and, it, it, and it's, you get sort of a dynamic generally where, you know, you really, um, you know, the, the best companies can still raise capital, but um, unless you're one of those, you know, kind of, um, you know, top 5%, top 10% companies, it's, it's, really, it, it's, it's significantly harder to raise capital. Other than raising capital, though, actually, a lot of other things get easier. So, um, you know, if you, look at, if you look at some of the most challenging things of the last two years, right, valuations were through the roof, and access to capital was pretty easy. But what were some of the most challenging things that probably many of you have found to be very challenging? 
hiring people, acquiring customers, especially if you did any kind of online marketing, um, you know, consumer businesses doing online marketing or B2B, you know, SaaS businesses doing marketing on, on platforms like LinkedIn or, um, or Facebook or Google, CACs have risen. And, and those two things are obviously very critical to almost every business, right? Getting good people and getting customers. And so those two things actually oftentimes get easier in a down market because you have um, less competitors being funded, less startups, um, early stage companies being funded. You know, during really frothy times, you may get, you may see like all these like ankle biting companies being funded just to copy what you're doing. And that can be annoying and make life more challenging and make cu customer acquisition more challenging because everybody's spending money trying to acquire the same customers. But during a downturn, that actually gets easier because you have fewer of those companies being funded and uh, less uh, money being spent on customer acquisition and advertising. So that, that can get easier. And then similarly, hiring um, becomes easier because you have less companies being funded, less uh, war for talent. Um, you have you know, maybe even certain companies either trimming their hiring plans or even trimming headcount and, and even maybe some companies in a downturn that, um, you know, that, that end up, you know, going bust and either laying people off or, um, you know, more people entering the talent pool. So some of those things that we've all been kind of uh, complaining about for the last couple of years actually can get easier in a downturn with the one exception being access to capital. So, and I, and I learned this because when I started StubHub in 2000, so I started StubHub in March of 2000, which was um, exactly one month before the, you know, web 1.0 uh, internet bubble burst. The, the internet dot com bubble burst in April of 2000, a month after I incorporated StubHub. And so um, I won't bore you guys with too many of the details right now, but it, um, you know, it was a it was a challenging couple of years to raise capital uh, for all the reasons I just described. But actually, some of the other things were um, it was actually a great time to start a company in a lot of ways, because there were not a lot of other startups being funded in our space. We had more um, access to kind of some of these new um, channels of customer acquisition, like Google paid search, you know, AdWords was new at the time. We, we employed that um, strategy really successfully uh, to grow StubHub in the early 2000s. Um, we were able to hire people, companies were laying off people, big companies like, you know, Yahoo at the time and others during the downturn were, you know, certainly hiring less and in many cases um, laying off people. So access to talent was easier. And so I learned that firsthand from my experience at StubHub. And I think it, it would become true today, again, if we, in fact, go into a downturn. Um, so anyway, that, that's, that's the big learning there. Cool. Um, yeah, the talent, a lot of people had questions about talent uh, getting more aggressive potentially with, with hiring. Um, so that's an interesting positive uh, consequence of this. Sachs, you wrote uh, the burn multiple post. Um, I think that's especially apt nowadays, potentially. So do you want to just comment on um, how to think about efficiency, running your business efficient, efficiently in this type of environment? Yeah. Let me speak to the risk of recession for a second. So um, just to try and put some numbers around it, there have been five recessions in the past 40 years. So people ask, well, what are the chances we go into recession this year? Well, five divided by 40 is 12 and a half percent. So the base rate, you know, would be 12 and a half percent. But I think you would just have to say, given the wealth effect of the stock market correction that it would be higher than that. I still don't think it's like above 50%. It's probably, I don't know, I'm just picking numbers out of the air, 30 to 40% chance. So still more likely than not that the economy stays good and continues growing. But I would say elevated risk due to the fact that we are seeing a slowdown already and then people are gonna feel a lot poorer. And you know, it, the, it, the correction in the real economy would start in, um, in those markets where there was excess liquidity, you know, like luxury purchases, um, collectibles, you know, sports cards, art, private jets, all that sort of, you know, if you notice that there was like a lot of froth in like those areas of the economy last year, um, it's because of this dynamic where people are feeling really flush and there was a lot of liquidity. They'll be the first to correct and then it'll start to trickle down through the rest of the economy, you know, second homes, things like that. So we'll, we'll see. I think, you know, Elevated risk of recession, still probably not the most likely scenario, but something for, for all you guys to think about. Um, regardless, to, to your question, um, Brian, about, you know, how do you think about operating, uh, or how do you think about capital efficiency during a downturn? The first thing is that 
investors during a downturn will look at slightly different things than they would during a boom. So during a boom, all anyone cares about is top line growth. Um, during a downturn, they'll start to, um, I mean, everyone still wants growth and they still care about that, but they'll actually dig a little deeper and ask about the efficiency of that growth and how much you're spending to achieve that growth. And if the, and there's, there's, I guess, two kinds of problems that you could have. One would be like a unit economics problem where, um, you know, you're, you're basically selling dollars for, for 90 cents. And so, you know, you, you see that in like a lot of physical world businesses where there's like, they've got like negative gross margins. Um, those types of businesses become really unfinanceable during a downturn. Um, SaaS businesses don't tend to have that problem because the gross margins are so good. Um, but I think, you know, the question would be around um, how much you're, you're having, how much you're having to spend to, for, to acquire those customers and, um, you know, or to, or to maintain them, you know, through, you know, operationally. Um, and so the, the, you know, the burn multiple is just a simple rule of thumb. It's you divide your burn in any given period by, um, by your net new ARR. And that tells you how many dollars of burn it's costing you to achieve one dollar of net new ARR? Um, you know, anything below two, I think, is good, and then anything above three is sort of suspect or bad. Um, so it's like a simple rule of thumb. So it's just something to keep in mind that as you grow during a downturn, you just want to watch not just your overall level of growth, but how capital efficient you are in doing that, because investors again, we'll, we'll tend to discount, um, you know, expensive growth uh, during, during a downturn. Um, so for, for all these reasons, you know, it can make sense when you're in a downturn to give yourself more runway, um, you know, buy yourself the, the capital efficient growth, don't overspend on the, you know, the, the, um, the inefficient growth, give yourself more runway, prolong, how much time you have before you have the next fundraising, you know, all the, all of those types of adjustments can make sense. Um, okay. This is a question that a bunch of people wrote in about uh, a little more tactical. Um, Jeff, you were talking about the, the wealth effect, right? This people suddenly feel a lot less rich. Um, number one, does that extend to companies, which is sort of in contrast to what you're saying about Microsoft and Apple's earnings? But uh, generally, could it apply to, to companies slash customers? And a lot, there was a lot of questions that came around, um, how can I know if my customers or prospects will churn or contract due to this, due it to a potential downturn? Yeah. Um, well, I think like, it, you know, the, I think the wealth effect is really more of a, a consumer effect. So if you if you're a consumer business and you have um, consumers as customers, which probably most of you don't, um, then then, yeah, the wealth effect could affect could definitely affect your, your revenue um, you know, forecasts and um, and and ultimately, um, you know, result in less revenue than than without that effect in place. I think the the, the thing, again, if if right now when you look at things like Apple and Microsoft's earnings in the last 10 days, like, you know, companies are still doing really well. And as long as companies are doing really well, you know, the stock prices can be somewhat divorced from the actual like income statements of these companies. And I think what, you know, I think that um, they did sort of get out of whack on the positive, um, you know, uh, direction when we had these, you know, huge multiples and now they're, you know, now they've corrected back down to normal. But if you think of them as being separate from the stock prices as being separate from the income statements, then as long as companies are doing well from like an income statement perspective, from an earnings perspective, they will probably continue to buy products, to buy B2B SaaS products as an example. Um, and, um, and things will not trickle down to sort of the revenue of, um, you know, to, to most of, of your revenue and, and income statements. Um, where that changes is if we do go into a recession scenario. If we go into a recession scenario, um, and you have um, growth starting to go negative, like GDP growth, which is what a recession is, because, and that can happen like if, if interest rates continue to go up because inflation goes up. If inflation stays high, interest rates will have to go, uh, go up in order to have kind of real positive interest rates. Real interest rates are really the, the nominal interest rate minus the inflation. 
And in order, if inflation stays high, interest rates are going to have to go up. If interest rates go up, that does affect like spending in corporate America because a big part of the spending that happens in corporate America is done on b- borrowed dollars, cheap cheap money. You know, corporate America can tap into cheap debt and borrow money and and uh, build up uh, debt at low costs if interest rates are low. As interest rates goes up, go up, it's it's harder for corporations to borrow money on a, you know, on a cost effective basis. And if they're borrowing less money, they're spending less money. And if they're spending less money, then that starts to trickle down to, you know, the revenue of like B2B SaaS companies, as an example. So, and, and so I think like, and and that would start to also point to kind of potentially, you know, um, that, that direction of a, of a recession. So I think it can, I think, you know, certainly in a recession scenario, I think we would potentially start to see, um, impacts that could take place on on revenue but having said all that with you know when you are when you are an early stage company and your kind of base rate of growth is 3x year over year you know you may modulate that growth you know to um you know two and a half x year over year but you're probably still growing pretty fast because you, you your market share is a percentage of you know, your, your market share is so small as a percentage of the overall market so you still have so much opportunity to grow you just may not grow quite as fast if interest rates are higher. Yeah, let me pick up on that point. Um, uh, Even if we go into a recession and we're not in one now, um, it's just not an excuse for not growing. You know, like VCs won't be like, oh, we can, you know, still invest in you because of this macroeconomic for, and the the reason is what, what Jeff said. If you think about like your TAM slides and all of your fundraising decks, which showed some gigantic pie chart, and then you're like some, infinitesimally small piece of that. I mean, your market share compared to the size of the market probably showed like 0.01%. Even if the overall size of the pie contracts 3% because we're in a recession, you should still be growing into that because you're such a small piece of that pie. So um, so investors just will never buy macroeconomic forces as a reason why you shouldn't be growing. So, you know, that bar remains there. And the, the but... But I think in managing your business, what you may want to do is try to figure out like wh- what's the efficient sort of frontier of growth where, okay, maybe we can, to Jeff's point, maybe we can grow two and a half X year over year very efficiently. We could sque- squeeze out like another half X, like to get to three X, but it would cost us twice as much money. And so maybe you don't do that, right? But you're still going to be expected to grow very substantially, no matter what the macroeconomic conditions are. And you can, I mean, you know, the reality is you are growing, um, you know, re- recession shouldn't affect startups that much because again, you, you are such a small piece of the market that you're trying to grow into. Um, and so look, er, you know, in a da- downturn, um, what, you know, what, what Jeff said, my experience has been that everything gets easier except fundraising. Um, you know, the war for talent gets easier. There's fewer competitors getting funded. Um, so, you know, everything gets easier except for one thing, which is just fundraising. Um, so uh, uh, should we t- talk about that? Just tips for running a process right now? Yeah, yeah. one, one more thing that uh, a couple of people asked about was um, communicating internally. So I, I think we've established that who knows if this was just a reversion to a mean or we might be entering something more uh, negative. But um, when you were running PayPal, uh, David, um, and Jeff, I'd love to hear the same question to you about StubHub. Did you feel obligated to communicate or explain this to your to the uh, the employees in any way? Or what advice would you have for the founders on this call? Well, we were going through the dot com crash, you know, back in 2000, 2002. So it was omnipresent that you know all the other startups in Silicon Valley, like almost except for us, were going out of business. So it was something we spoke to. I would say that like. In 2008, 2009, when uh, we went through sort of the Great Recession, it was much less of a issue because you know it wasn't specific to Silicon Valley. Um, I mean, all you really need to communicate in those circumstances is just that, hey, the company raised you know plenty of money you know before this latest downturn, and we're well funded, and we have the capital to you know make it to the next you know milestone. Um, that's if, I mean, we're not even in that situation yet, right? Like we're still in a healthy economy. So, um, you know, so I, I don't, 
I never think it's a good idea to freak the employees out. Um, I think you generally want to be assuring, but um, or reassuring. But it's also good to to make sure that you have clear goals and milestones about like what the company's trying to get to before its next, you know, call it fundraising event. Jeff, any anything to add to that? Oops, I think Jeff, I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. I was on mute. Um, so. Um, you know, my experience from running StubHub, as I said, like I started the company uh, the month before the dot-com bubble burst. So our entire life as a company, the first, you know, you know, the first two, two years or so, two and a half years, because that, that, that uh, dot-com bubble burst was sort of this like long protracted kind of, you know, 24 months of, um, of like downward price pressure in the stock prices of all the companies that had gone public. Um, and also, you know, recession and, and very challenging fundraising environment. So like we were just kind of our, um, our DNA from the beginning was very much about like frugality. Um, and I'm not saying that this is the right approach for every company here. And I think, you know, if you've recently raised capital and you have, you know, north of 18 months of cash on your balance sheet, then you can actually use this time to actually potentially be aggressive. I think this get this gets you know much more relevant for companies that have say less than twelve months of cash, le less than twelve months of runway, um, and even more acute if you have say less you know six months of runway. You know the the difference between having two years of runway right now and having like six or nine months of runway, I think, is huge in terms of how you kind of react in these in these times, um, and really is probably the key question for for many of you in terms of how you how you react right now. But we were always, I mean, just to answer how StubHub was operated at that time, like we were just extremely frugal. We didn't spend, I mean, like we measured every single dollar we spent. There was an article in Time, I think it was either Time or Newsweek, um, as we were kind of coming out of that kind of 2001 time period. And this is not what I, what I wish I was known for, but this article was written. And the title of the article, the headline was, Frugality is this startup's ticket. Um, and it was about StubHub and me. And so, you know, you don't necessarily want to be known as being frugal. That's not like a competitive advantage. I'm not saying like that's a great thing, but that, but that's just, that is how we operated the business because that's just the, that's the environment we were in. And so um, anyway, and, and we never had more than, you know, six or nine months of cash. We were like scraping together money. So, um, you know, so we were kind of in that more defensive mode than I think you might be, if you had say two years of cash in your balance sheet right now, you may actually look at this and say like, Hey, we actually, are relatively strong relative to the competitive set. And we actually are viewing this as, as an opportunity to be on, on, in offensive mode. Cool. Uh, that's a good segue to get right into fundraising. And David, maybe maybe just hit the, some of the hardest stuff right in the beginning. So in a scenario where a company has 12 months or less of cash in the bank, what, um, what are the types of things they should be thinking about or planning for at this point? Okay, well, the first thing is you, you got to think about when you're going to fundraise. Um, I don't like to leave it later than nine months of runway because if something happens to, you know, it, it, if at least if you something goes wrong in your fundraising process, it gives you like maybe one quarter to react and try and fix it, and then run a new process with, say, six months of runway. Um, once you're down to three months of runway, I mean, your back's really against the wall and you're getting into like almost the wind down period. So you need to be thinking about fundraising again, like nine months out. And you should be thinking about, you know, what metrics you want to hit before that, um, if possible. And, you know, again, at most, you would leave it to six months out. Um, so, you know, even when you have two years of runway, I mean, that's really call it five quarters of runway before you need to raise again. So, you know, just, just think about it that way. Um, the second, just tactically in a, in a negative environment, you're gonna need to go out to more firms and run a tighter process. Um, I would, before you go out and start talking to any firms, I would have your data room ready. You know, especially when you're a SaaS company and all of the metrics are like so clear in terms of what you should be, what investors are gonna ask for. We publish them all, right? Like it's on, our blog, we publish SAS grid for all of you to use to generate your charts. Just, you know, get all of that stuff organized and ready before you go out. It will just make you look so much more, and you know, you're gonna have to create it. So don't wait for investors to ask you for it. Um, the, the next thing would be around, um, you know, giving the right answer to the question of um, what, 
investors will always ask you like what valuation you're expecting, or they'll try to come at it indirectly by, by asking you how much you're looking to raise. And then they can kind of back into using standard dilution numbers. They can kind of back into a valuation. The right answer to that question is always, you know, we're going to let the market decide. We're going to let the market tell us, especially in a time like this, because again, the biggest mistake um, founders can make is pricing people out of their process. And I see this happen like all the time. Um, you know, founders will go into a process and say, we're looking for this valuation. Well, you know, a lot of investors will hear that, think the valuation is too high and they just won't even participate in the process. And so you just don't want to price anyone out in the current environment. You really do want to let the market tell you, especially in a market like this where no one knows where valuation levels are, like let the process tell you, run a, a tight process, run a broader process than you maybe normally would. And don't, you know, don't have too many preconceptions about what the valuation should be, or don't ask to raise too much. You know, we saw a deal recently that we thought was looked pretty good. I think they were trying to raise a series B. And then the last slide, they said they were looking for 75 million. The series B should have been 30 million. So right there, that told us the founder had very unrealistic expectations. And, you know, we decided not to go deeper on it. You know, now maybe the founder will eventually correct, they'll correct their expectations, but you know, there's other things, other deals that we could spend our time on. So, uh, so just don't do stupid stuff like that to price people out of your, of your process. Can, David, can you double click on a tight process? What do you mean by that? So, you know, have all your materials ready, have your deck ready, you know, maybe have gone through your deck with your advisors and, and we're happy to do this with you. We've done it recently for companies going out where we'll give you feedback on your deck, um, you know, have a spreadsheet of all the investors you want to talk to. I would, again, broaden the list. Um, you tend to want to cluster the meetings so that you can create some urgency or competitive dynamic. Um, and uh, yeah, don't, don't, don't run some like loosey goosey process where you're talking to like one or two investors here and then a couple more over here and like be very methodical about it. Um, now, one thing I will say about clustering is um, it can maybe make sense to have like maybe tier one and tier two investors and you space them out by maybe a few days, not, not weeks. Um, and what you would do is if you get feedback from your first batch of investor meetings, you at least would have time to incorporate that feedback into your deck. Um, so it can be helpful to have that dynamic where, you know, you don't go out with the wrong deck or the wrong story to like every investor. And now like the process is hopelessly broken. It can be good to give yourself a little bit of time to react, but, but I'm not talking about like a week. So I'm talking about maybe a few days. Yep. Um, Jeff, there's a, you know, some founders are going to find themselves in the situation where they are at nine or six months of, of cash. So they should be raising now. Then there's the question of uh, things are so volatile at this moment. Um, should they give themselves a month to see how things shake out or uh, should they just sort of have the discipline and go for it um, when they feel like they're ready? Like they're ready? Any uh, guidance on that? I think, I think that, you know, the, the first priority is like you, you need to capitalize the business so that you, um, you know, so that you don't, uh, run out of capital. Um, and I think if you're like in that six month window, I think you're kind of, you know, you're sort of out of time and you, you kind of need to go out now. The, the good, the good news about like now is I think it's actually better than like two weeks ago. It's, it's impossible to know what the volatility is going to be in the next couple weeks in a couple days, couple weeks in the public markets, but it felt more volatile like a week or two ago. So maybe, maybe things are stabilizing. And, and if that's true, then, you know, um, people are less, investors are less spooked in the moment and, and more receptive to kind of hearing, you know, kind of hearing new opportunities and, and new pitches. So I don't think it's like a complete disaster to go out right now. If you're, if you're at six months, you have to do it and do it, you know, and do the best process you can. Your valuation may be lower, but we've already talked about that. And that's something that as long as you don't price yourself out of the market by, um, having like, a, a an expected amount of dollars raised that's way too high or, or signaling a valuation that's way too high, 
um, you you at least will have those options and you can kind of live to see another day and, and you know, finance the business and move on. Um, you know, I think if you have like nine months or, you know, kind of nine to 12 months, yeah, you might wait a couple weeks here because if things do, if in fact we're kind of past that sort of um, that, that extreme level of volatility that we saw, you know, a few days in the last 10 days, and it's kind of starting to stabilize a bit, then yeah, then probably two or three weeks from now is going to be even um, even better. It just people will become more calm and sort of more receptive. And and you and if you have nine or ten months of cash, you probably can afford to wait two more weeks. So that would be that would be my that would be my guidance. Cool. Uh, a bunch of questions in the chat. This is actually a very interesting thing. Um, I remember when I first joined VC, learning about was where the money comes into VC funds. So you hear about all these VC funds or firms raising giant funds, and yet we're in this like period of uncertainty. What is the psychology? What are they going to do with all this money? Uh, are they just going to sit on it and wait uh, to see what happens? David, can you opine on kind of yeah. the LP model? Well, well, yes, the money has been raised by those funds, but maybe they deploy it more slowly. Um, I think last year was sort of unprecedented in terms of the number of, uh, uh, in terms of the, uh, like the outflows, the, the capital being deployed and the number of new unicorns being minted. I think they were minting something like three unicorns. Weren't there like a thousand unicorns minted last year? It was like three a day. Um, and, you know, historic amounts of money being invested in startups. The, you know, I see a question in the chat here. Are you seeing growth funds at BC rounds slowing capital deployment? I mean, the biggest players last year in terms of late stage capital were again these crossover players like tiger like code two tiger was deploying something like um i think they deployed like 15 billion last year you're talking about you know over 1 billion a month of capital and um i mean they were deploying you know that size fund in less than a year well they have to go out and raise the, the new version of that fund. And so it has to be on their minds, like what are LPs willing to fund? Are they still, are they gonna be willing to fund a new $15 billion fund in less than a year? And my guess is that given the correction in the markets, um, you know, everyone has to be forecasting that that type of fundraising process is gonna be more difficult. So, you know, I think, um, so, so I think what happens is that these funds slow down a little bit and try to make the money last longer. They try to give themselves some time diversification within the portfolio, meaning that last year we know the valuation levels were high. This year they're going to be lower. So we're going to try and you know balance things out a little bit by trying to get more, more deals into the portfolio this year. Um, and this is kind of what we're what I'm hearing is that uh, Tiger and Co2 are like, I don't know if it's like a full pause, but um, definitely the activity has slowed down. I mean, that the answer is yes, the activity has slowed down. Um, yeah, the only thing I would add on to that is, you know, typically the, the, most funds have a five-year investment time horizon and then another five years for, um, you know, kind of, uh, li li you know, exiting. Um, so sort of a 10-year horizon all in. And you started seeing, you know, you know, a few years ago, it was more like funds were being invested in say three years, and then it was like two years. And then in the last, you know, two, last couple of years that even compressed below two years and funds were being deployed as quickly as say, you know, 18 months or even less in certain cases. So it wouldn't, you know, to, you know, in order to kind of get this diversification across vintages where, um, you know, if, and, and given the delays that the lag that we talked about earlier with, with uh, venture rounds lagging sort of the public markets, like it makes sense for venture investors to sort of slow down a little bit and get the benefit of what are likely to be um, more normalized valuations over the next 12 months than say what they saw in the last 12 months. So by slowing down, they're able to kind of take advantage um, of that sort of lower, those lower multiples. And, 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 and it would be fairly, uh, it would be back to the historical norms of say three year fund cycles instead of, you know, 18 month fund cycles. Awesome. Yeah, one, one thing I would say is if you raise money last year, especially in the second half of last year, um, you know, congratulations. Um, I do think that, you know, the, the, the monster rounds we saw, the valuations we saw in the, like, like I said, really in the last six months of 2021, they were pretty much historically unprecedented. I, you know, I would just 
treat that money as being, I, look, I, I don't think anyone should come out of this meeting like and go into layoffs, okay? That's not what we're saying. I think things are still good. We're not saying rest in peace, good times, but I would just treat that money that you raised in the second half of 2021 a little bit more dear than you otherwise would. I think that it may not be so easy to raise that kind of, those kinds of amounts at those kinds of valuations in the future. You may, you know, you're going to have to perform over the next couple of years to grow into that valuation in some cases. Uh, just don't like squander the money, you know, like the, it, it was really easy to raise big amounts last year. It may not be in the future. Just make that, try to make that money last. All right. Uh, Jeff, any parting thoughts? Um, no, I mean, I think, you know, I think, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see kind of how things play out over the next, you know, three, six months and whether or not this, um, you know, this is just a resetting of prices um, or it, you know, it kind of turns into more of a, of an economic recession and, and hopefully it'll be just the former and not the latter. And, um, and I think there's a, you know, a, a better than 50, 50 chance that that's the case uh, in which case, you know, I think, um, like I said earlier, if you have like more than 12 months, really more than 18 months of cash, you, you might actually, you know, look back on this and see it as an opportunity. Um, and if you have, you know, less than 12 months of cash, I would just be, you know, I, I would conserve it and, um, you know, not, not increase spend and not spend on, you know, kind of um, more frivolous things or more experimental things in, until you get, you know, your next round raised um, and probably start to think about, you know, that next fundraising, um, you know, within that sort of six to nine month time frame. Um, all right, we're at the top of the hour. All you on the phone are busy people, so we'll let you go. Thank you for all the questions, for showing up. We'll send a recording of this out afterwards, as well as uh, some follow-up summaries of what we discussed. Uh, but thanks, everyone, for joining. And of course, if you've got any follow-up questions, just hit up any of us at Craft, and uh, you know we're honored to support all of you. And um, talk to you soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.